Our speaker today is Michael Whalen, a professor of anthropology at the University of Tulsa. And I just learned as I met him uh, coming into the auditorium today, he's been at TU since 1978, which means he spent almost his entire academic career at the University of Tulsa. He received his master's degree and PhD in anthropology and archaeology from the University of Michigan. Do I dare tell them when you earned that? In 1976. <laughs> the year I graduated from high school. <laughs> Dr. Whalen's research interests are in cultural evolution and the development of complex societies like that presented in the upcoming West Mexico exhibition. His research includes the excavation of individual communities and surveys of regional settlement patterns in northern Mexico, Mesoamerica, and the United States Southwest. His technical interest is ceramic analysis, and as you will see in the final program of this series with Dr. Pickering, ceramics will be the star attraction of the West Mexico Ritual and Identity Exhibition. Dr. Whalen began his career in Mesoamerica research with his dissertation excavation at a site occupied between approximately 1600 BC and 500 BC. Since 1989, he has been investigating the Casas Grandes regional system through a program of large-scale surveys and excavations in northwest Chihuahua, Mexico. His research over the years has been supported by the National Science Foundation and the National Geographic Society. At last count, Dr. Whalen has at least 26 publications to his credit. Dr. Whalen's program today is, as you can see on the screen, Ancient Mesoamerica from the Olmecs to the Aztecs. Let's give a warm Gilcrease welcome to Dr. Michael Whalen. Thank you all for coming. It's a real pleasure to speak here at Gilcrease. Uh, my task is Herculean today to manage something like 2,500 years of Mesoamerican prehistory in an hour, but uh, we'll, we'll see what can be done. Now, well, let me start out by saying something about Mesoamerica, uh, what it is and how it's defined. As you're probably aware, the prefix... Can everybody still hear me if I talk out here? Oh, okay. As you're probably aware, the prefix meso in Mesoamerica means middle or in between. It comes from the Greek term meaning middle. So as you can see there, Mesoamerica, that's the shaded area there, is in between North and South America. Now, much of Mesoamerica is included in the modern country of Mexico, but not all of it is. Um, let me get a... Here we go. We can see on here the boundaries of Mesoamerica. Those are the heavy black lines that uh, are drawn up on the screen. Here's the northern boundary of Mesoamerica, and here the southern. So the north part of the Republic of Mexico actually is not included in Mesoamerica. And other countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and the uh, western portion of Honduras are included in Mesoamerica. So a number of modern nations make up the country. It's a common error to think that Mesoamerica is synonymous with Mexico. And in fact, it actually isn't, as you see here. Now, I also want to make two basic divisions in this big area that we call Mesoamerica. One of them is cultural, and one of them is topographic. Yeah. Here's the topographic division. Uh, there's no key on this, but the areas that you see shaded in red on this map are highland areas. The areas that are green are lowland areas. So that, that's a fundamental <coughs> contrast in Mesoamerican topography, the highlands and the lowlands. You can see that both coasts are lowland areas. The isthmus of Tehuantepec right here is also a lowland area, and then most of the Maya area over here is lowland. 
tropical jungle as well. Uh, this distinction between lowland and highland is more than just of geographical interest. It has a profound effect on cultural development in Mesoamerica. We'll see a little bit more about that later. There's also... Yes, sorry, I had these slightly out of order. There's also a cultural division right here. You can see part of Mesoamerica in this slide is shown as dark brown and part of it as gray there. This, this is a distinction which doesn't really have a formal name, like Highland and Lowland, but I like to think of it as the Mexican part of Mesoamerica and the Maya part of Mesoamerica. The gray area right here would be the Mexican part, the dark brown area there, the Maya part. Now, both of these are indisputably Mesoamerican cultures, no question about that, but they're different in many of their fundamental undertones. As a matter of fact, uh, if any of you are familiar with modern Mexico today, you'll be aware that this cultural distinction still persists. There's a Maya part and a Mexican part. In fact, in 1871, the Maya area came within an inch of seceding from Mexico, yeah, although they didn't do it. Well, let's look at the, the, the face of the land in Mesoamerica. Here's a shot taken in the Central Valley of Mexico right here. I'll start off by noting that a lot of the land in Mesoamerica is harsh in one way or another. Uh, Mesoamerica is a land of violent rainstorms, hurricanes, earthquakes, constant tremors. Uh, in 1943 there was a huge volcanic eruption uh, that destroyed a, a great, great deal. Villages, crops, all sorts of things. In 1972 and in 1981, there were massive earthquakes, too, that caused a huge amount of damage in the country. In fact, one prominent scholar of Mesoamerica made the, I think, very appropriate remark that the people of Mesoamerica live in the mouth of the volcano, which, uh, in fact, they do. Mesoamerica is a beautiful setting as you can see here, but it's also a fierce one. It's not what I would describe as a tame natural setting. And this is very much reflected in the outlook and beliefs of the native peoples of Mesoamerica. The old gods there. The old gods are thunderers, earth shakers, mountain movers. Uh, they can be generous if they're propitiated, but they're not gentle, benevolent deities at all. In fact, they're harsh, fierce ones, all of them. There's also the idea in Mesoamerica, a recurrent theme, that the world has been cataclysmically destroyed a number of times. The peoples of Mesoamerica have a fundamentally different concept of time than we do. We conceive of time as linear. That which has come, comes not again. Uh, Mesoamerican people, and many of the people of Asia as well, have a cyclical concept of time. So that the passage of time is akin to the turning of a great wheel. That which has been before will be again when the cycle completes itself. The Mesoamericans saw five major cycles of the earth, each of which ended in ruin and destruction and the growth of a new world under a new sun. So this idea of perpetual cataclysm then. Well, all right, let's go on and look at the actual prehistory of Mesoamerica. You can see four major time periods right here. Um, and the first one, you'll notice the longest one, the pre-ceramic. That's from the very first appearance of humans in the area. And I'm not going to try to talk about it today. We're just going to talk about the last three periods that you see there, the formative, the classic, and the post-classic. And you can see the approximate dates that go along with each time period. I can't talk about all of them in all of the parts of Mesoamerica today, so what I'm going to do is talk uh, about each time period in terms of its biggest and most spectacular development. Then pick one example of each one. I'm also not going to try today to talk about the, the Maya world. I'm only going to focus on the Mexican world. And the reason for that is, the Maya are fascinating people, but the reason for that is that the West Mexican exhibit, which is coming here, is certainly part of the Mexican world. So I want to spend the most time on it to put it into its context. All right, well, let's start with the formative period here. You can see from the dates on the screen, it's a very long period, more than two millennia 
in fact, of Mesoamerican culture history, uh, we actually divided into early, middle, and late parts, the dates of which I won't bother you with. But let's just say that this long time period is a time of tremendous culture change. There's a huge amount of evolution packed into the formative period. In fact, that's always been my specialty in Mesoamerican archaeology. It starts in its early days, the early dates that you see up there. It starts with semi-agricultural tribes that are barely sedentary. It ends with incipient states by the early centuries of the Christian era. So a huge amount of human cultural development is packed in there. Now we have a time to travel all the way through the formative period. So what I'm going to do is talk about the Olmec here. And as the, the caption implies, this is Mesoamerica's first big cultural development. It's the first example of what we would call a complex society. These are societies that are large, that integrate thousands of people, that are hierarchically differentiated, and that are therefore capable of doing big things. So the Olmec are the first that we see right there. Now the Olmec culture is right here. It's the area here. You can see, I don't know if you can see that brown contrasting color, but that's, that's the Olmec area there. It's on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, so it's a lowland phenomenon. So the first big cultural development of Mesoamerica comes from the lowlands. They're not going to hold that lead for long, though. But here they certainly do. There's several big uh, Olmec sites that we could talk about. Can, can you all read the names of those sites? Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe you're too far away. Here's La Venta, right here. San Lorenzo. Those are two of the most famous of them. Now, the area in which the Olmec culture developed is, is like this. This is what the Gulf Coast lowlands of Mexico look like today. Incidentally, this is the location today of modern Mexico's oil fields. That's where all of them are today. That's a resource, of course, that was meaningless to the Olmec and other Mesoamerican people, although it's mighty significant today. All right, well, let's take a look at Olmec sites. And there's something else I could mention. Uh, I guess I should stay here. There's something else I could mention, too. And that is that the Olmec at all of their sites display a particular and very highly recognizable art style a way of portraying things. The reason I mention this is that in early formative, middle formative times, this art style spreads very widely over Mesoamerica. It reaches all the way down into Guatemala, uh, up into central Mexico as well. We'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. First, let me introduce you to the Olmec art style. Here's the big site of San Lorenzo. Right here, this is an aerial view. You can see a number of its components. There's a big conical pyramid, number of long, everything that you see is a big lump. Right there is a, an artificial construction. Now, these are just solid constructions of earth and stone. We speak of these things as pyramids, and people sometimes are inclined to confuse the pyramids of Mesoamerica with the pyramids of Egypt. They're quite different things. However, the pyramids of Egypt, well, they're 5,000 years older to start with, but they're also mortuary monuments. They're intended to contain the embalmed corpse of the pharaoh forever. Then, Mesoamerican pyramids, on the other hand, virtually never have interments inside them. They're simply artificial mountains on top of which temple structures are built. So the two, well, they're, they're called synonymously. They actually function very differently. Then. All right, here's to the Olmec art style here. This is a drawing of one of the many stone carvings that you see there. And characteristic elements of the Olmec style are reflected right here. You have, you have quasi-human figures, like these right here. They have human bodies, but they have tiger faces then, with a thick snarling lip uh, of tiger, sometimes large tiger fangs as well, sometimes tiger... I'm sorry, I keep reading the wrong one. Sometimes tiger ears, as you see on this one. We call these, these creatures weird jaguars, sort of like a weird wolf. These are weird jaguars then. And they're imitating the jaguar 
here. This is a native animal in this area, and all Mesoamerican peoples consider it of, of vast supernatural power. Then. It's also associated with water and rain in Mesoamerica. But this image set of tiger-faced humans is the dominant theme throughout Olmec art. We find creatures that look like this spread all through Mesoamerica. Something else we find, it's also very characteristic of the Olmec, some of you may have seen pictures of these things, are the colossal heads then. And there's a couple of people in there to give you an idea of the scale of this gigantic one right here. These things are carved out of basalt then, and they weigh many tons apiece, as you can imagine there. You can see, and they're all broadly the same. That is, they all have human faces. Here are a couple of other shots of them, as you can see. They all have human faces. They all have flattened noses. They all have very thick upper lips. Observe that in a bunch of them. They all wear some kind of helmet-like uh, device on their heads. I won't take the time here to show you all of them. There are several dozen that are known, but their facial features are distinctive. That is, they don't all look just the same then. Now, it has been suggested um, that these are African features then. Um, this is not a respected view in Mesoamerican archaeology. I think the situation is that these are not African features, but feline ones. And that is, the flattened nose, the thick snarling lip are the same ones that you see on the stone carvings then. So they're felinizing these people right here, perhaps to imbue them with the power of the jaguar. Then. These very possibly represent rulers um, in Olmec society, although the Olmec did not write. There's no writing system, so we don't really know what these people, what these objects were. Now, I mentioned that the Olmec interacted widely with other people in Mesoamerica, and just to give you a single example, all of those ornaments that you see in this picture right here, this is one of the caches from the site of La Venta. Then, those are all jade. Then, jade is the precious stone in Mesoamerica, known to the Aztecs as the sweat of the gods. Then, jade comes from the highlands of Guatemala, then, which is where all this stuff was imported from. So we have pan-Mesoamerican trade going on at this time, not only in Olmec symbols, but in fancy luxury things as well. Well, I hate to say it, but for all of its fame, we really don't know that much about the Olmecs. Um, we know a little bit about its antecedents. Uh, we presume it evolved from local coastal people in this area, because we know they were there before, we don't know much about the process, and we actually don't know much about the working of Olmec society either. So there's still a huge amount to be learned there. I have found in my life that it's a, a, a common misconception that we archaeologists know all about the past. <laughs> actually, we're far from that. And that's certainly the case here. Well, as, as fascinating as the Olmec are, and as much as could be said on them, Let's move on to the next big stage of cultural development in Mesoamerica, which is the Classic period. And I might have put the subcaption on here, the first round of state formation. This is the first, the first states get started at the end of the formative period, as I mentioned a moment ago. They reach their first fluorescence in the Classic period. In fact, the Classic period could really truthfully be described as the time of great fluorescence of Mesoamerican culture. You get writing systems developing, you get elaborate art styles developing, urbanism develops, um, large powerful states develop in a number of areas as well. You know, the fact that you have these big powerful states developing says an awful lot about social organization in Mesoamerica. It means that um, many thousands of people can be brought together and gotten somehow to, through organization, integration, and management to produce colossal works then, which simply could not be done by people at simpler levels of development. You'll see in a moment some of the biggest of uh, the classic works then. So all this takes a huge amount of organization and management, which classic period societies 
very clearly possessed them. Well, all right, let's turn then to the big site of Teotihuacan. I didn't put a slide in with the name on in particular, but there it is, Teotihuacan, there. Uh, it's an Aztec word, actually. It means the place where the gods are then. Now, the Aztec came much later than Teotihuacan, which was in ruins at that time. The Aztec, though, were so impressed with the huge ruins of Teotihuacan that in their mythology, the place had been built by giants at the beginning of the world then. And it was the scene of the first great convocation of the gods, actually the fourth, in which they resurrected the sun and started the new world, hence the name where the gods are. Yeah. The people of Teotihuacan certainly did not call themselves that, though we have no idea what they call themselves, for they did not have an extensive writing system either. Yeah. Here's Teotihuacan, though. It's, it's actually an urban, it's gigantic urban center, something like 60,000 people living in it. The red, I'll show you in a close-ups in a minute, but the red structures that you see there are, are, are temples, pyramids, and ceremonial structures. You can see they form the core of the city and the black rectangles all around it are well, what we call apartment complexes. That's where the bulk of the people in the city lived then. So we're looking at a real urban situation here with very dense packing of a large population. In fact, interestingly, the city of Teotihuacan seems to have acted like a giant magnet and drawn into it 75 to 85% of the population of the Valley of Mexico. So the place is just empty around it. So we, we know where it got its people. It drew them in from the hinterlands. Here's an aerial photo looking down the main street of Teotihuacan. You can see two of the big pyramids right here. And when I say big, I mean really big. This is the Pyramid of the Sun right here. It is something like 900 feet on a side then. 300 meters on a side, what, um, three football fields on a side then, and it is a solid construction of earth and stone. That is, there was no hill uh, or natural rise there when they started to build it. They simply laid out on the ground a square, three football fields on a side, and said to the people, fill it up, then, which they very effectively did. Here's a shot of it right here. To give you an idea of scale, oh, sorry. to give you an idea of scale, that's, that's a person, an adult, standing right there. This structure, in fact, is as large at the base as the Great Pyramid of Cheops in Egypt, which is the biggest of all of the pyramids. It's only, however, about one-third as high as the Pyramid of Cheops. It presumably had a shrine or a temple structure on the very top of it, because it just goes up to a little flat platform up there on the top. You'll see what I mean. You'll understand now what I mean when I talk about the kinds of massive works that classic period societies were capable of producing. You can imagine the cost and the organizational requirements of, of building something like this. Now, Teotihuacan itself actually seems to have been built to a standardized plan also. It didn't just grow up helter-skelter. And you can see here, you can see the circle right here. This is pecked into the plaster floor of one of the houses, and then it's got two across through it like this. These are sighting marks there. They lay out uh, an angle of sight which is seven and a half degrees north, uh, east of north. Seven and a half degrees east of north. The entire city is laid out on that same grid. Buildings a mile and a half from the center of the city are still very precisely on the same grid. So this is, I guess, a perfect example of what you call organized growth. They have tightly controlled growth. And in fact, um, the grid of residential buildings extends about a mile and a half out from these ceremonial buildings that we have been looking at here. Now, the buildings themselves uh, today are only pale shadows of what they were. When, when you look at these Mesoamerican buildings, you have to keep in mind that originally they were covered with a gleaming white plaster 
and painted with fantastic colors as well. We see them today just as rough stone constructions, and that, that's analogous it look, to looking at the plucked carcass of a brilliantly feathered bird, then trying to get an idea what the bird actually looked like. This is one of the temples at uh, Teotihuacan. You can see the elaborate carving that's on there. This is, this is one of the very powerful classic Mesoamerican deities, Tlaloc, the uh, rain deity. This is Quetzalcoatl here, the plumed serpent there. Both of these are just in rough stone like this. Here's a reconstruction. This is inside the National Museum in Mexico City where they, they repainted. So you can see microscopically what colors originally were used there. So it would have looked something like that in its heyday. Now we have, fortunately, although there's no writing at Teotihuacan, we do have some other indications of how the place operated and what sorts of things were important to us. Obviously, there must have been a very powerful and comprehensive organization there to supply the wants of the great population there, to keep everything integrated and organized. In typical Mesoamerican fashion, there were two pillars to the organization of this society. One of them was religion and ceremonialism, and the other, militarism. Yeah. Take them together, they make a pretty powerful stew then. And I'll show you some of the indications here. Oh, I forgot that I put this in. Let me di digress for one second. These are the apartment complexes that are spread so thickly out from the central part of the city. This is where, in structures like this, the bulk of the people would have resided. These apartment complexes probably represent descent groups, clans, lineages, something like that. Here's a shot of some of them being excavated. Then you can see how close they're about less than a meter under the ground here. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them spread all around, most of which have never been opened. Okay, well here we are, back to the twin pillars of Teotihuacan society, militarism and religion. I'll take the latter first, religion, then. You can see there, this, this is inside one of the fancier of the apartment complexes, in fact. And this is a, a fresco here. If any of you are familiar with old world frescoes, these are done by exactly the same technique. You make a white line plaster, apply it to the wall, and wait until it's hard but still slightly damp. You then paint on that, and the paint is absorbed into the still slightly damp plaster, hence the name fresco or fresh. Yeah. Well, these are frescoes done just the same way, uh, independently invented, apparently. And these are going around the walls of one of the rooms in one of the apartment complexes. The more elaborate of the apartment complexes were heavily decorated like this, as were many of the temples. Now, you can see that there are figures there. Here's a, a close-up of one of these figures. Uh, it's obviously a human, very richly dressed human with elaborate an elaborate headdress and the green plumes of the Quetzal bird, a sacred bird in Mesoamerica then. Uh, the bundle, the purse-like bundle that he holds in his hand is what we call power bundle. It's simply a symbol that the bearer possesses supernatural power then. Uh, also at Teotihuacan, they use these things, we call them speech scrolls then. I guess you could think of them as analogous to the bubbles above a, a cartoon figure, although they don't have any actual, there are symbols inside them, but no actual writing then. So the figure is presumably chanting or speaking then. Likewise, in one hand he holds his power bundle, in the other hand, these figures are all two-dimensional, in the other hand, like this, the one he holds out like this, drops of rain fall. So we frequently get this image, the richly dressed priest with drops of rain falling from his fingers. Yeah. Something of consummate concern for farmers, naturally. Yeah. These are also always standardized images. The facial features never vary. They're just like stick figures. Yeah. And they're all over the place. Yeah. So the power of priests and priestly figures in Teotihuacan must have been enormous. In addition, they're warriors as well. Here's a drawing of one of these central Mexican warriors. He's dressed in typical style. He carries a shield with three darts 
On the end, they kept balls of cotton tied around the razor-sharp obsidian points of their darts so that they wouldn't break. And as soon as they hit something, they'd come off and penetrate. Though, in his upraised hand, he carries an atlatl, or spear thrower, which was the typical weapon there. Uh, he, too, is chanting or speaking like this. And here's another set of figures here. This is, you can see, this is a tiger then, but no ordinary tiger. He wears a great headdress of plumes, uh, and he is, is a little bit destroyed down in that corner, but he's holding up one of his paws like that, in which is a blood-dripping human heart then, which he's getting ready to take a bite out of then. We see a number of images like this of, of richly dressed tiger figures with human hearts. In later times in Mesoamerica, specifically in Aztec times, there were two major military fraternities in society. One of them the eagles and the other, you guessed it, the tigers. Then, Are there eagles at Teotihuacan? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, there are. There's one right there. Um, this is a stylized heart, you know, from other aspects of iconography with his three chambers. Here in front of him, so he's got a style, and the eagle sits there with a heart in front of him, and liquid, whether it's blood or rain, drips from his beak like this, as does another cascade with eyes in it. And we don't know what the purpose of that might be, but we do get these motifs, the twin motifs of Teotihuacan, actually triple motifs, warriors, tigers devouring hearts, and eagles with hearts sitting in front of them. If you read older archaeology books uh, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, they have the idea that Teotihuacan was a peaceful theocracy. It was a place ruled by benign priests. Uh, yeah. In fact, that's what I learned when I had my first Mesoamerican archaeology course. We now understand that militarism was a powerful force in Teotihuacan society. The idea of peaceful theocrats is pretty much gone by the board. As a matter of fact, it's interesting to note that in the last days of Teotihuacan, this would be about 500 AD, then the number of priestly scenes declines and the number of military scenes increases. Then, so it certainly looks like the influence of one side of society is waning while the other side is waxing. Then. Well, so much more could be said about Teotihuacan, but let's conclude by noting that its influence in Mesoamerica is extremely widespread. It's a single place itself, but it touches almost every place else in Mesoamerica. Uh, they did a tremendous amount of craft production at Teotihuacan. Uh, there's also a mountain of obsidian right beside Teotihuacan. It's a distinctive green color. And uh, the craft products and the obsidian are traded all over Mesoamerica. Here's, here's an example. These are Teotihuacan-style vessels. They're, they're cylindrical vessels. You can see they've got three feet on them. Uh, sometimes the feet are slabs. Sometimes they're conical like that. Sometimes they have lids like this as well. It's a real typical Teotihuacan-style priest painted on that one there. We find these things all over Mesoamerica. And here's the real thing, though. This is what's called Teotihuacan thin orange pottery. And we call it that because it's thin and orange, as you can see right here. See, it's got, some of them have the three feet on them, and some of them don't. Thin orange pottery is all over the place in classic times. Now, the reason I mention this is that it's very clear that West Mexico, which you're going to be focusing on from here on out, was closely integrated into the Teotihuacan interaction sphere. As we find thin orange pottery, we find those slab-footed cylindrical vessels, we find Teotihuacan-style architectural elements, all of those things show up in West Mexico also. So there are people there in the classic period. They're not as highly developed as Teotihuacan, although they're on the way then, and clearly are interacting with it. All right, well, let me move on here to 
the post-classic period. The classic period itself comes to an end well, in central Mexico with Teotihuacan about AD 500. We don't look on this as cataclysmic. We talk about the collapse of classic period cultures. It happens all over Mesoamerica, on the Gulf Coast, central Mexico, Oaxaca, all over the place. And we always refer to it as the classic period collapse, although we don't think anything catastrophic happened. Floods, famines, aliens, invasions, anything like that. What it appears, rather, is that the classic period societies fall apart through internal organizational problems. And that's a much more likely hypothesis. Not nearly as dramatic, I guess. It wouldn't make the status of the chariots of the gods, but it's a more likely explanation, in fact. In any case, by about 500 AD, the big first big classic states have fallen apart. There follows a period of some centuries of, I guess you might call it a power vacuum in central Mexico. Uh, places are still developing on their own. Central Mexico, West Mexico, Oaxaca are still moving along, but nobody is yet powerful enough to dominate the whole area. It's only about A.D., I put the round figure A.D. 1,000 up here. It kind of depends on where you are in Mesoamerica, but sometime between 900 and 1,000, we get um, what we refer to as, well, you see it up there, the second round of state formation. That is to say, local polities in different parts of Mesoamerica begin getting powerful enough that they can eat up their neighbors then, expand their territories, <laughs> and form, um, well, these would all be conquest states. Okay. Now the most famous of these post-classic states, well, we'll come to them in a moment, but let's just note before I get there that a number of these late post-classic states were actually seen in operation by the Spanish, because they were functioning when Cortes and his henchmen arrived in 1519 on the coast of Veracruz then. So we have extensive Spanish accounts here, particularly of the people called the Aztec. And I, I imagine they're the most famous, actually it should be infamous because they were a pretty awful bunch, um, of all of the Mesoamerican people. Now, Aztecs themselves would not have recognized the name Aztec. They did not use it. They did not so refer to themselves. That's a later historical appellation. They also didn't write, but we know from Spanish accounts that they actually called themselves Mexica. You can see from the term there, that's where we get the term Mexico also. You can see the Spaniards' problem. They can't speak the language. They get there, they say, what is this place? To the Aztecs. And the Aztecs say, Mexica. And this, all this, Mexica, also. So the Spanish Hispanicized that to Mexico, and hence the name of the place then. So the Aztecs certainly are the single most famous post-classic people. Um, they originally came from northern Mesoamerica, and they were, they were rather barbarians at the time they moved into the Valley of Mexico in early post-classic times. They moved in during the power vacuum after the collapse of Teotihuacan and set themselves up as fairly disagreeable people at the time. Uh, throughout, and this was about A.D. 1250, so this, this would be about contemporary with the early Middle Ages in Europe. The First Crusade was going on about this time, in fact, that the Aztec were moving into the Valley of Mexico. They set themselves up and through a series of cunningly contrived alliances, betrayals, intrigues, wars, conquests, succeeded in establishing themselves as a major power in central Mexico. In fact, after they had done so, this would be by about 1300 AD, there was a series of Aztec kings who were resolute militarists and expanded the Aztec Empire to its peak probably in 1400 to 1450 AD. This is only 70 years, less than 70 years, before the arrival of the Spanish. So the Aztec had not been functioning at their peak capacity for more than a couple or three generations before the Spanish arrived and, I guess you'd have to say, cut them off at the knees 
then. So their, their culture did not come to a natural end then. All right, well, let's look at the Aztecs. We know more about them, I imagine, than any other Mesoamerican people, thanks to the efforts of some of the Spanish. Some of the Spanish were dismal fanatics who regarded everything that was Indian as diabolical and worthy of instant destruction. And so an awful lot of stuff was destroyed. Some of the Spaniards, however, were people of uh, broader sensibilities. They taught Indians to read and write Spanish and Latin and encouraged them to annotate the picture manuscripts, which the Aztecs had. They did not have an effective writing system at all. So you'll see one of these in a minute, and you'll see the Spanish notations on it with pretty remarkable spelling, in fact. So I guess these guys could write Spanish, but they didn't spell it very well. So thanks to a few enlightened people like that, we, we know a lot about the Aztecs. Yeah. Well, here's the scene of the development of Aztec power. It's the Valley of Mexico up here. He's right in central Mesoamerica. Here's the shot that I showed you before. This is the Valley of Mexico. It's, it's a high altitude area. This is about 6,500 feet here. It's surrounded by snow-capped volcanoes, as you can see there. The one you see right here in front is Iztaccíhuatl, which in Nahua means White Lady, and the other back there, Popocatépotl, which means the Smoking Mountain. Then, uh, Iztaccíhuatl began smoking uh, from a decade ago, something I remember reading about it in the paper. So it's, they're, they're still possibly active. There's still an awful lot of seismic activity here. You can see this is good farming land up here, although it's cold. Uh, so you have to take certain steps to manage it. Now, in Aztec times, there was a huge lake in the center of the Valley of Mexico. If any of you have been to Mexico City, modern Mexico City today, you'll be aware that there is no lake. In fact, it was drained in the 1600s by the Spanish for various irrigation projects, and modern-day Mexico City was built on top of the Aztec capital, which had been out there in the lake. In fact, here's the Aztec capital here, Tenochtitlan. You can see it's on a partly artificial island out here in the center of the lake, and it had stone causeways or bridges like this that connected it to the land. Upon the draining of the lake, the Spanish built their things right on top of the Aztec things. I'll show you some of them in a minute then. Uh, on the marshy ground there with the effect that everything began sinking. There's a 16th century cathedral in Mexico City, for example, which is canted about like that because it's just sinking into, into the muck. In the 1850s, Mexico considered moving its capital to drier ground, but it was just too expensive, so they didn't do it. Anyway, here's a, um, a Spanish map of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, with its great ceremonial complex here in the center, surrounded, the, the, the water around it was shallow, then three or four feet deep, and with these stone causeways here. I can recommend very highly a fascinating book. Uh, it's called The Discovery and Conquest of Mexico, and it was written by Bernal Diaz. The book has been continuously in print for the last 500 years. In fact, Bernal Diaz was one of the soldiers of Cortez when he was a young man, so he was actually there and saw this stuff. And then when he was an old man, maybe basking in the recollections of the glories of his youth, he wrote The Discovery and Conquest of Mexico in which he related all these things. I particularly recall one passage. He said, we came, we came, this way, from the causeway of Iztapalapa. He says, we went across the causeway, we saw the city of, of he said the Aztec city, rising up out of the lake in front of us. He said, we saw the white buildings and the temples gleaming in the sun. He said, all around me, I heard the soldiers asking one another if what we saw was not a dream or an enchantment. Yeah. So it certainly seemed so to them. They had expected to see nothing of the sort. Here's an artist's view of Bernal Diaz would have come along this causeway right here. All right, once you get into Mexico City itself, there's a giant ceremonial complex, or I should call it Tenochtitlan, because Mexico City is the Spanish name. There's a giant ceremonial complex like this, which is right in the center 
of Mexico City today. Have any of you been to Mexico City? Yeah, okay, well you remember the big central plaza where the Metropolitan Cathedral is and the big Alameda, the big open spot right there. That's right where this was. Yeah. You can see there are two temples. One of them was to Tlaloc, the rain god, and the other to Tezcatlipoca. Yeah. Here's the situation. There's one of the big temples that you were just looking at right there, and that's, that's its position. These are all colonial buildings from Spanish times around it. There's the Metropolitan Cathedral right here. This is the older one right here that's so badly tipped then, and this is the big central plaza, the Alameda of Mexico City. Yeah. But you can see how the Mexico City is just sitting on top of the Aztec material. In fact, you cannot excavate a sewer line in Mexico City without running into Aztec material. There's so much of it there. Here, in fact, is work on the main temple right here. This is the base of the main temple right here, and there, there are the streets of Mexico City with cars going through them right up here. So they're literally right in the middle of the urban setting. They have today made a fantastic museum on this spot, so which I highly recommend. It's called the Templo Mayor, or the Main Temple Museum. So if you find yourself in Mexico City, don't miss that, it's great. All right, well, the Aztecs are infamous for their gory human sacrifices also, like this. And the, the sacrifices actually, well, the Aztec were a, a bloodthirsty people. Uh, they had both religious and political bases, though. The Aztec, I think, truly saw themselves as the soldiers of the sun, because according to their beliefs, the sun, and that was the incarnation of the fifth world that they lived in, the world it lasted as long as the sun lasted. They knew that the end of the world was certain. As soon as the wheel completed its cycle, the world would end. However, they believed that you could hold off the end of the world. You could slow the turning of the wheel by nourishing the sun then. The sun could only be nourished by the blood of sacrifice like this. So they considered themselves the soldiers of the sun, whose duty it was to feed it, to keep it going then. Uh, they sacrificed appalling numbers of people. This is the Tzompantli right here. It's a reconstruction of it, or the skull rack, which stood below one of the big temples in Mexico City. Now, in Aztec times, those, those are real skulls. According to the Spanish count, there were 100, 134,000 of them in this particular skull rack right here. I think the Aztec also used this as a political device, too. They could say, come join the Aztec Empire, which I'll tell you something in a minute. And they'd say, we'll treat you well, which they didn't. But they'd also say, and if you do anything we don't like, we we'll always need sacrificial victims then. So I think it had both political and uh, religious connotations for them. In fact, this brings us to the whole question of the Aztec Empire, because they had the biggest empire that was ever formed in Mesoamerica. Now, this is central Mexico, right here, and the two different colors there you can see are differently designated as tributary provinces and strategic provinces. We need not go into those details here, but that shows you pretty much the extent of the Aztec Empire. You can see it's not a coherent structure, it's not consistent, there are big areas that the Aztec did not control uh, in between. In fact, um, the whole empire was a very loosely administered structure, but a big one. It's estimated that at its height there were something like five million people included under it then. The city of Tenochtitlan, at its height, is estimated to have been five times larger than contemporary London also. So, a, a big setup. Now, we can best describe the Aztec Empire I guess these are not scholarly terms, but I would describe the Aztec Empire as a giant extortion racket. Then, because it, it simply was a bleeding of everybody for everything that they had. The Aztec would defeat them in battle, they'd say, okay, here's your tribute. There's an Aztec tribute list right there. And those, the writing you can see on it is Spanish annotation that has been added to it. They would give, they would assign crushingly heavy tribute burdens so that the whole population of the area would have to work 
90% of their time just to pay the tribute. And they'd say, if you pay, won't bother you. If you don't pay, you'll soon be very sorry. Yeah. And then they would just leave. The local rulers were responsible for collecting the tribute and sending it to Mexico City. In fact, it was quite rare to see an Aztec in the outer parts of the empire then. And if you did, it generally meant big trouble coming soon then. As you might imagine, the people of Mexico bitterly hated the Aztecs. There was nothing they hated so much as an Aztec. You may have asked yourself at some point, how is it that Cortes and 520 Spaniards, that was the size of his force, were able to conquer the whole Aztec Empire in three years. The answer to that question is, they couldn't. Okay. When Cortes arrived in Mexico City, in Tenochtitlan, when he marched into Tenochtitlan, he had his 520 Spaniards with him, but marching behind him were nearly 50,000 Indian soldiers. So all Cortez had to do, he, he was a sharp guy, so he learned this quick. He would come into a place, they would say, who are you and what do you want? He would say, my name is Cortez, I serve a great king across the water, and I have come here to liberate you from the tyranny of Moctezuma. And the people would say, man, just wait a minute while we get our weapons. And it would fall in behind him, and so he, he didn't conquer Mexico with 500 Spaniards. He conquered it with something like 50,000 Indian soldiers. The Aztec, in fact, were not good empire builders. They seem to have generated a remarkable amount of hatred in Mesoamerica, and structures like that don't generally last very long. Well, the situation then... Oh, I might also note that the Aztecs were extremely militaristic. They would need to be to sustain their empire. And uh, their, their conquests, as this scene shows, were by force there. Here you can see eagle and tiger warriors then too, that belong to those two military fraternities that we first saw at Teotihuacan. They continue strongly uh, among the Aztec as well. Well, the situation then, well, I'll just go back to the one we had, and we'll leave those warriors on the screen. The situation then is that in 1520, 1519, Cortes and the Spaniards arrived. He succeeded in defeating the Aztecs and conquering the place. If he had not, someone else would have fairly shortly then, because Cuba, only 90 miles to the west of Yucatan, was filled with hungry Spaniards then. So I guess you could say, in a word, that the prophecies came true the wheel turned full circle, the cycles completed themselves, the world ended in chaos and ruin, and it was reborn under a new sun. Although now the sun is Spanish rather than Aztec. Well, at the end, I want to say a little bit about West Mexico, so as to tie that in right here. And I won't say too much because you're going to hear more about that another time. I've already noted that West Mexico was firmly tied into the Teotihuacan interaction sphere. There's people there, there's cultural development going on there. They have basically the same formative, classic, post-classic time periods. They're following similar developmental trajectories, though not as rapidly then. Uh, in the classic period, as I say, they're interacting with Teotihuacan. By post-classic times, population is increasing in West Mexico. Power structures are beginning to emerge there. By about 1200 AD, uh, some considerable power structures have emerged. In fact, one of them is the Empire of the Tarascans. Then, these folks, uh, during the time period between about 1440 and 1470, were in fact the principal enemies of the Aztecs. There was a constant series of border wars between the West Mexican Tarascans and the Central Mexican Aztecs. In 1479 and 1480, an Aztec army of something like 32,000 men, according to the Spanish records, made a large incursion into Tarascan territory. They were met by a Tarascan force of about 50,000 men. Uh, after days of fighting, uh, the Aztec army withdrew defeated. That's the only time they ever attempted to expand anywhere and were unsuccessful at it, and they didn't come back then. Tarascan Empire that continues until its conquest by the Spanish as well. 
Well, I think I'll stop here. I don't want to weary, weary you too much. It's a nutshell view of Mesoamerica. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> If anyone has any any uh, questions or comments, I'd be glad to hear them. Yes. What actual states of modern day Mexico are we talking about? So I could look it up on a map. For Tarascans, this would be Michoacan. Michoacan. Uh huh. And uh, the Aztecs. Well, you know, Mexico is is a republic. Like this one, it has states, and then it has a federal district uh -huh. in the center, like Washington D.C. Mexico D.F. is the federal district. And that's where most of the Aztec stuff is. Okay. Hmm? What about that first culture that you talked uh, about? The Old Mech, they're in the modern state of Veracruz. Veracruz. Mm -hmm. Pretty much exclusively Veracruz, yeah. You said the Tarascans were about were the only ones the Aztecs didn't conquer. What about the Tlaxcalans? The Tlaxcalans are interesting people. Um, they are a small group of people in the center of the Aztec Empire. When Cortes got there, the Tlaxcalans told him, they told him tales of the, the horrors of the Aztecs and their brutality and all this. Cortes said, well, I see that you all are still armed. You know, how, how is that if you're, if you're Aztec slaves? They said, the Aztecs took everything from us but our weapons then. The situation was that the Aztec society required warfare because it was the only method of social advancement then. So they effectively kept the Tarascans there as somebody to fight with them so that the warriors could cover themselves with glory and advance socially because there was no other means for doing so in Aztec society. So the Tarascans were, they didn't pay tribute, uh, but they uh, fought wars with the Aztecs every so often. Yes. Why did the Olmecs pick the line seven and a half, seven and a half degrees from true north? We don't have any idea why any of those reference were chosen. They could have been. There, there's a number of possibilities. They could have been astronomical, and this has been several thousand years ago. So we're not the stars. We're not exactly the same position there. So there's slight differences there. We don't know of any major constellations or anything like that. Um, that are seven and a half degrees off. Um, there's nothing obvious then. Another alternative, and this is a more hopeless one, is that it's a mythological referent then, which we don't really have any clue. So, to answer your question in a few words, we don't know. <laughs> it's something we can see, but we can't explain it. <coughs> Uh, on your map of tribute and influence of the Aztecs, number 27 down there was in Guatemala. Is that Kamenalhu, you, or what is that? That was an area on the coast of Guatemala which the Aztec took special pains to get, even though it was so far away, because it produced cacao. And cacao is the raw material for chocolate. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, if any of you are chocolate addicts, you can thank Mesoamerican people for that, because they're the ones who developed Cacao. When the Spanish arrived, they found the Aztecs with this bizarre brown bean, which they would grind up, put into hot water, and froth by spinning a wooden, sort of like a whisk, in it like that, and then drink it with relish. The Spanish had never seen anything like that, and they tried it and decided it was pretty good. And Spanish ships soon were carrying cacao, hence to be chocolate, back to the old world. So that, that was a specific strategy of the Aztecs to gain control of cacao growing industry. To do that, they had to make a complicated series of treaties with Zapotecs, Mixtecs, and other people through whose lands they passed. Dr. Weather, are there any relationships, trade, or, or uh, other kinds of influence between these Mesoamerican cultures and people in our area at, at approximately up here, not very much. Uh, some Mesoamerican symbolism seems to have made its way north in uh, both the southwestern and southeastern United States. Uh, there is some use of serpent symbols, uh, sometimes plumed serpent symbols, like the Quetzalcoatl, they call Quetzalcoatl to mind. Uh, so it seems that some ceremonial concepts made their way north. However, 
we don't have any good indication of large-scale transmission of Mesoamerican culture. That, that, that does not seem to have happened then. One, you know, one thing your, your question makes me think of, something that I should have mentioned about Western Mexico, though, and that is it's the only place in Mesoamerica where they did metal working. Yeah, metal is not used anywhere else, and it seems very likely that the West Mexican tradition of metalworking was acquired by sea from Central and South America. In South America, metalworking is very ancient then, but not anywhere in between then. So there seems to have been seaborne trade, um, at least along that Pacific coast. Yes? Looking at the picture, and it looks more like a stork than an eagle. Well, the guy, yeah, the guy, he's got a stork headdress up there, uh -huh. and then he's got eagle feathers okay. on his body mm -hmm. right here. But I was thinking a stork is like, I don't know, I know they bring the babies, and so it seems like it's more, it might have been rather than the fierce eagle, it was the well, you know, birds birds often have ceremonial associations in different cultures. We have the stork delivering babies in our culture, but these folks wouldn't have had that idea at all. It's that specific to us. So for I them, don't know. I, I see it as the warriors were the peaceful stork warriors, and the, the fierceness of the eagles is the tiger. Well, I think what you're doing is, I think you're attaching your Western concepts of things to these folks. And that's one thing we want to be careful not to do, because they were people like us, but they did not see the world like we do. Okay, uh, oh yes. Were the positions of the pyramids aligned with the sun and the moon and the seasons? Is that not part of the uh, astronomical... Uh, well, actually not. They're, they're just oriented on that seven and a half degree axis. Um, and as, as uh, I was saying before, we, we can see the orientation, but we can't explain it. Yeah. Whatever the referent was, though, it, it was consistent all through the city. Yes? On a lighter note, uh, one of the delicacies in Mexico City are baby eels, mm -hmm. and they're grown in little pools of water around Mexico City, uh, as that part of the original land, and did the Aztecs partake of that delicacy? Yeah, it probably it is. Um, the Aztecs made very heavy use of the lake and lake resources. In fact, the Spanish were amazed when they got to the Valley of Mexico to find the thoroughness and intensiveness with which every available inch of the valley and the lake was being utilized to produce food, because it was so heavily populated. Yeah. So, yeah, I imagine that's an old tradition that still continues. Okay, well, thank you again for your attention.